Well, I'm delighted to be here with all my Israeli friends and activists, and I've been looking forward to coming to Israel for so long. As you probably know, Israel has been on my bucket list for many, many years. And yesterday we uh, went out to lunch and had a delightful meal at Anastasia's restaurant. And I must tell you that the food that we had there was every bit as good as the food you'll get in London, New York, Los Angeles, Tokyo, Shanghai, New Delhi, or Melbourne. Delicious food, charming people, great service, and cruelty-free. I've asked Trix, as usual, my wife, who's sitting here in front, to handle the PowerPoint presentation, because I don't understand this high-technology contraption. <laughs> King Lear, late at night on the cliffs, asks the blind Earl of Gloucester, how do you see the world? And the blind man replies, I see it feelingly. Gloucester must have been a vegan. Now the great writer Rudyard Kipling wrote of young men dying in World War I. And if they ask you why we died, tell them that our fathers lied. That legacy of lies continues today. Everything the public thinks they know about the meat and dairy industry is a preposterous lie. You see, the world today is crying out for only two things, leadership and the truth. That's it. Tonight, I'm simply going to tell you the truth. The wise Chinese have a term for it, Jiao. <laughs> Listen to the friend who tells you the truth even when it hurts. So let's just tell the truth, fearlessly and forcefully. That is what the Sanskrit word satyagraha means, the truth force. Now Brendan Kennelly, in the book of Judas, wrote, if you want to serve your age, betray it. But what does that mean, to betray your age? It means expose its lies, humiliate its conceits, debunk its arrogance, expose its secrets, and condemn them to face harsher truths. Alvin Toffler wrote, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. We are in the process of getting people to unlearn and relearn. Now, I have long admired the great Prussian general Count Moltke, a soldier who preferred to think rather than to speak, a man silent in seven languages. You see, it takes courage to stand up and speak. It also takes courage to sit down and listen. Now there was a time when my favorite food was filet mignon and lobster, a fact for which I am so profoundly ashamed today. So what made me as a young investment banker decide to leave the world of lobsters and learjets in exchange for shelters and slaughterhouses? To take nothing but pictures, own nothing but memories, leave nothing but footprints, kill nothing but time. You probably know that many years ago I decided to take all the money I'd ever made and give it away with warm hands and die broke. And so far we're right on budget. <laughs> Today we support about 500 projects in 45 countries for children, animals and the environment. So you see, something happened to me. I had been to Dante's Inferno, but unlike Dante Alighieri, I did not have Beatrice for my love, nor Virgil for my guide. I heard the screams of my dying father, 
as his body was ravaged by the cancers that killed him. And I realized I'd heard those screams before. In the slaughterhouse, on the cattle ships to the Middle East, and a dying mother wail as a harpoon explodes in her brain as she calls out to her calf. Their cries were the cries of my father. They were identical. And I discovered that when you suffer, we all suffer as equals. And in their capacity to suffer, a dog is a pig, is a bear, is a boy. So when I look into your beautiful faces tonight, I recall the words of the Greek poet Horace. Change only the name, and my story is also about you. So this is where we work today. In China, 7,000 magnificent moon bears, their limbs torn off in traps, are imprisoned in steel coffins welded shut as a catheter drains bile into a bucket which the Chinese drink. For 26 years, the bears can't move, they go insane. We built a big hospital in Korea for animals. And in Korea, the dogs are beaten to death in the marketplace because Korean butchers believe that pain and suffering makes the meat tasty. In South Africa, 5,000 tame orphan lions are drugged and killed with guns, spears, or torn apart by hunting dogs. And they call it sport. In Canada, 300,000 baby seal pups are clubbed and skinned alive on the ice, their tiny hearts still beating. And in Australia, my country, we killed 90 million innocent kangaroos who happened to adorn our coat of arms the largest land animal slaughter on the planet. And we sent millions of animals born on Australian soil on death ships to the Middle East and elsewhere where their eyes are stabbed out and their tendons are slashed for 30 pieces of silver. Every penny I invested in the Basatine slaughterhouses in Cairo was utterly wasted. The cruelty there is just as bad as ever. In Asia, where we're quite big, uh, dogs are suspended on steel hooks and skinned alive to make fur trim in the co for coats sold in the West. And we treat the oceans as a private pantry and as a public toilet. The Pacific gyro now is so full of plastic, junk, and human feces, it has created a floating footprint bigger than India. Dolphins and whales are stabbed to death in the shallows of Taiji in Japan and the Faroes Islands. Huge bays are blood red. Now some of you would probably know my involvement in Sea Shepherd in a number of capacities as a, as a financier as well. And you also probably know we send our ships to Antarctica every year to ram the Japanese whalers in the Southern Ocean. And we've already sunk half the Norwegian fleet, the whaling fleet and half the Icelandic whaling fleet, and we'll do the rest too. One hundred million sharks are torn from the sea and their fins are hacked off and their bodies thrown overboard to die agonizing deaths for shark fin soup. And factory farms, or factory farms, what a joke, uh, animal factories, now spew chemi chemicals into the oceans, creating hypoxic dead zones of one million square kilometers, killing coral, plants, and ocean animals. And so-called unviable dairy calves, who cannot be sold for veal, are killed by dairymen jumping on their rib cages and crushing their hearts or smashing their skulls with a hammer. That is the law approved by ethics committees all around the world. Billions of bouncy little chicks are ground up alive in mechanical mincers simply because they are male. And as you know, we travel a lot and we've taken footage of religious sacrifices which make the 21st century 
look like the new dark ages. And children in poor countries starve because their croplands now produce meat for foreigners. I won't be showing you any more pictures, but that is where we work nowadays. Now in human history, only 100 billion people have ever lived. Seven billion people are alive today. And we humans torture and kill two billion sentient, living, loving animals every week. Two billion. And we stab and suffocate one billion ocean animals every three hours. One billion. Trillions of fish are ground up into pellets to feed to livestock. Vegetarian cows are now the world's largest ocean predators. And ocean sequester, as you know, more CO2 than all the forests of the world put together. 10,000 entire species are wiped out every year because of the actions of one species. And we now face the sixth mass extinction in cosmological history. If any other organism did this, a biologist would call it a virus. It is a crime of unimaginable proportions. We humans have become mammalian vultures, feeding on the rotting carcasses of animals killed by others. Today, we are not fed by, far by farmers, but by contract killers working in a slaughterhouse. Now, there are only two peak predators on the planet humans on land, and orcas in the oceans. In the 20th century, humans killed 200 million members of their own species. Orcas killed none. And no country should expect protection from their own governments either. In the 20th century, 100 million people have been killed by their own governments. Now, Victor Hugo said, there is nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. But I say there is nothing more destructive than a bad idea whose time has passed. The time for me has passed. If it ever existed in the first place. But happily, the world is changing. 20 years ago, Twitter was a bird sound. WWW was a stuck keyboard. <laughs> Cloud was in the sky. Skype was a typo. 3G was a parking space. Google was a baby's burp. And Al-Qaeda was my plumber. <laughs> now the most beautiful word ever written in any country, in any language, at any time in human history came from India from the Upanishads 3,000 years ago. Ahimsa, non-violence to any living being. So when people ask me to define myself what religion I am, or that sort of thing, I invented a new word, Ahimsan. I say I am Ahimsan, a person who rejects violence in all its forms. So therefore, by definition, I must be vegan. Veganism is the baseline foundation for an ethical and authentic life. Now, Ahim sons avoid all forms of violence, not just in our deeds, but in our thoughts and our words. That is the difference. Paradoxically, some vegans who claim not to harm animals use aggression and profanity which is profoundly harmful to human animals. And it doesn't help. <laughs> Ego and Facebook fighting have become blood sports for vegans who refuse to shed blood.
So it is possible to be a vegan and at the same time be a thoroughly obnoxious, rude, crude and counterproductive person and a useless activist in the long term. But to be ahimsan and vegan is to be enriched, elegant and enlightened. Not because this type of veganism describes our nationality, our politics, our religion, our diet, or our lifestyle, but because it describes our character. Veganism defines your character, not your diet, not your lifestyle. This is so because we object to violence wherever and whenever it occurs, even in our words. And this is not just about animal rights. It is also about human wrongs. Animal rights is now the greatest social justice issue since the abolition of slavery, and you can put that in the bank. Animal rights is a revolutionary event more powerful than the Industrial Revolution, the Reformation, the Hubble Telescope, or anything ever conceived by Galileo, Copernicus, Einstein, Darwin, or Freud. Because it protects the most precious of all things, life. We, the people in this room tonight, are on the right side of history. We, we, the people in this room, are creating the new enlightenment, the second renaissance. Let it begin in Israel. Now Christians know the golden rule, do unto others as you have, would have them do unto you. And that is true, it comes from the New Testament. But it actually goes back even further to the Babylonian Jew Hillel in 70 BCE. And in fact, it goes back even further than that, to the Analects of Confucius, 500 years BCE. In fact, it was inscribed on the human heart long before the dawn of writing. Now, the great anthropologist Margaret Mead said, never doubt that a few committed people can change the world. Indeed, that is the only thing that ever has. So can we do it? You know, there are only 13 million Jews in the world, but they play such a vibrant role in international affairs. Look at the number of Nobel Prizes that they win every single year. Now, Trix and I sat in the, uh, in the stadium at the Olympic Games, full of pride, as Australia, our country, with a population of only 20 million people, won more medals than every country in the world, with the exception of the United States and Russia. <laughs> Few people. Tibet's population is only 3 million. But who hasn't heard of the plight of the Tibetan? But there are over 600 million vegetarians and vegans in the world. 600 million. And that is bigger than the United States, England, France, Germany, Spain, Italy, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Israel, all put together. If they were one nation, we would be bigger than the 27 nations of the European Union. And despite this massive demographic footprint, we are still drowned out by the raucous, hunt and, sh hunt and kill and shoot and cretins who believe that violence is the answer when it should not even be a question. So restaurants that dress up a dead animal 
are gastronomic tobacconists. They don't fool me for a second. I know that they're in the business of putting lipstick on a corpse. You see, animals are not just other species. They are other nations. And we murder them at our own moral peril. Now, the great historian Barbara Tuckman defined folly, foolishness, as acting against our own best interests. Whenever someone acts against their own best interests, that is the definition of folly. And Occam's Razor, named after the 14th century Jesuit priest, says this, when presented with a number of possible solutions to a problem, the simplest one is always the best. And that idea is now used by engineers, lawyers and courts, and scientists. So let's just apply these two tests to the meat industry problem. Forest depletion by the meat industry costs three times as much as the global financial crisis in, uh, five years ago. And it happens every year. Zoonotic diseases from factory farms threaten a pandemic to rival the Black Death, which wiped out half of Europe. And recently, the World Bank said that one influenza pandemic alone would cost three trillion dollars. One. Two million people already die every year from zoonotic diseases, diseases that came from animals to us. And 75% of the infectious diseases in the past 30 years came from animals. And this is not information from some radical animal rights character. This came from the Livestock Research Organization. Meat and dairy is killing us and our economies with cancers, heart disease, osteoporosis, and diabetes. Last week, I was in Singapore and found out that 34% of all the young Singaporean women under the age of 30 will have diabetes by the time they are 65. And Singaporean women are highly educated, but they've been fooled into following our bad meat and dairy habits. And Dr. Kasli, while writing in The Lancet, said that India now accounts for 70% of the world's cardiovascular disease because of their love affair with dairy. And Medicare has already bankrupted the United States. They would need $8 trillion invested in Treasury bills just to pay the interest, and they have precisely zero. They could shut down every school, university, army, navy, air force, homeland security, FBI, CIA, and they still will not have enough free cash flow to service their long-term unfunded Medicare liabilities. So how big is eight trillion dollars? It's a hard thing to get your hand around. Well, that is how much the whole of Asia needs for the next 10 years for their electricity, roads, water, telecommunications, high-speed rail across China, ports in Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, India, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka, and the new Silk Road from Central Asia to Europe. That's $8 trillion. It is four times as big as India's GDP and double the total reserves of India and China combined. That is just what happens in America, caused by their bad eating habits. It's blown their Medicare budgets out of the water. Now, many people here would already know that water is the new oil. Nations will soon be going to war over it. Underground aquifers that took millions of years to fill are now running dry. As a young Boy Scout, I drilled my first well, and we struck sweet water at 80 feet. Today, we built an orphanage nearby in Bangalore, and at 800 feet, we're sucking mud. In China, at 3,000 feet, the drill head is still dry. Now, you will all be outraged if 10 jumbo jets crashed every day with no survivors. Well, the same number of children die every day through water-related diseases. The mighty Colorado River, the Rio Grande, the Indus, and the Yellow Rivers 
now no longer reach the sea, sucked dry by the meat and dairy industry. Whilst four billion people suffer today from water scarcity. So why do I speak to you about water? Because it takes 50,000 liters of water to produce one kilo of beef. It takes 1,000 liters of water to produce one liter of milk. And a dairy farmer gets 28 cents a liter. What a preposterously stupid industry. It could not possibly survive if they had to pay for the costs of their externalities and didn't rely on government handouts. One billion people today are hungry. 20 million people will die this year from malnutrition. Cutting meat by only 10% will feed 100 million people and going vegan will end malnutrition forever. And food prices are skyrocketing. It used to cost me for Thai rice for my projects in Southeast Asia, 197 US dollars a ton. And the price went up to 1,015, a five-fold increase in five months. And poor countries sell their grain to the West for hard currency, whilst their own children starve in their arms and the West feeds it to livestock. So we can eat a steak, Am I the only one in the room who sees that as a crime? Every morsel of meat we eat is slapping the tear-stained face of a hungry child. When I look into her eyes, do I remain silent? If everyone ate a Western diet, we would need two planet Earths to feed us. We've only got one and she is dying. The earth can produce enough food for everyone's need, but not enough for everyone's greed. And greenhouse gas pollution from livestock now vastly exceeds that of transport. Cars, trains, buses, ships, lorries, the lot. And their methane is 20 times more potent than CO2. The melting Siberian permafrost is now a ticking time bomb. The Yuma Peninsula in Russia is a case in point. When it releases its sequestered gas, the game is over. The Himalayan ice fields are correctly called the third pole, like the North Pole and the South Pole, because they irrigate half the world's population through the Indus, the Ganges, the Brahmaputra, the Yangtze, the Yellow River, the Mekong, and the Irrawaddy. And these big glaciers are melting fast. I presented these numbers to 2,000 wealthy entrepreneurs in New Delhi, including Amartya Sen, who had recently won India's Nobel Prize in Economics. And I mentioned the same numbers to Muhammad Yunus after he'd won the Peace Prize. And I said that all the good that he had done with Grameen Bank would vanish when Bangladesh drowns, to say nothing about Manila, Mumbai, Calcutta, Ho Chi Minh City, and Bangkok. And then Trix and I had dinner with Al Gore, and we discussed the same numbers. And I delivered a speech in Melbourne recently with Dr. Peter Dirty, Australia's Nobel Prize winner in medicines. No arguments with me from any of these wonderful Nobel laureates, but lots of arguments from our grubby politicians and their cronies in the meat and dairy lobby. So Upton Sinclair was right. It is impossible to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on him not understanding it. Now, Admiral Denny McGinn, the chief of US warfighting requirements said recently, we have learned that nations will raid and invade long before they starve. And we freak out in Australia when we have a thousand refugees arrive on our shores in leaky boats. Imagine greenhouse gas emissions hitting 500 parts per million or a three degree temperature rise, creating 100 million equal refugees in one year. This calamity will reshape 
the geopolitical landscape forever. We are now facing the perfect storm. If any nation had developed weapons that could wreak such havoc on the planet, we would launch a preemptive military strike and bomb it back into the Bronze Age. But we can't. It's not a rogue state. It's an industry. The good news is we don't have to bomb it. We can just stop buying it. But George Bush was wrong. The axis of evil does not run through Iraq, Iran, or North Korea. It runs through our dining tables. Weapons of mass destruction are our knives and forks, and increasingly nowadays, our chopsticks. <laughs> See, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. This disgusting industry will end because we run out of excuses. Amen. In President Lincoln's inaugural address, he appealed to the better angels of our nature. But I don't think that was enough. I say we must also destroy the dumber demons of our lusts. There is a Swahili saying, if you want to travel fast, travel alone. If you want to travel far, travel together. Today we no longer have this binary choice. We have to travel far and fast. So veganism is the Swiss army knife of an ethical future. One instrument solves all our ethical, economic, environmental, water, and health problems and ends animal cruelty forever. <laughs> Veganism is the enchanted key. It opens locked doors to secret rooms in your own castle. It rearranges the furniture of your mind. Veganism is your friend. It is your future. And it is the only future worth having. Yes. It is our last and best chance of creating wiser, kinder, and more sustainable futures for all of us. And farmers are the ones with the most to gain. Farming won't end, it would boom. Only the product line would change. Farmers would make so much money they wouldn't even bother counting it and I'd be the first to applaud them. <laughs> Believe me, please tell your politicians that veganism is the engine of redirected economic growth. Any political party that does not promote veganism actively does not deserve to govern. And in the process, governments would love us. New industries would emerge and flourish. Health insurance premiums would plummet. Hospital waiting lists would disappear. Hell, we would be so healthy, we'd have to shoot someone just to start a cemetery. <laughs> And veganism gives us, most importantly, the peace dividend. I addressed the World Parliament of Religions and I said that the peace map is drawn on a menu. Peace is not just the absence of war, it is the presence of justice. Justice must be blind to race, color, religion, and to species. If it is not blind, it will be used as a weapon of terror. And there is unimaginable terror in those ghastly gulags we call factory farms and vivisection laboratories. 
where, as Lord Acton said, absolute power corrupts absolutely. So talking about peace while still, still killing animals is like loving literature and burning books. They are mutually exclusive ideas. They are incompatible in the same way that science is incompatible with the Flat Earth Society. So in my journey, I have learned that a man is measured not by how much money he makes, but how much of it he's willing to give away, particularly to strangers. And if you wish to increase a man's share of happiness, do not aim to increase his possessions, simply decrease his desires. So Socrates and Epicurus were right. An unexamined life is not worth living. In fact, it's not a life, it's a life sentence. I know I did not find my character on Wall Street because it lives on the road to Damascus. And my heart resonates to the words of W.H. Auden. If equal affection cannot be, let the more loving one be me. Now Martin Luther King said, cowardice asked the question, is it polite? Expediency asked the question, is it safe? Vanity asked the question, is it popular? But conscience asked the question, is it right? <laughs> Our lawmakers have got to set up a new system. We need a new kind of jurisprudence, a new legal system entirely. The Latin term for it is foro conscientiae, a court of the conscience. Now, when India kicked out the British, they used a Hindi word, swaraj, meaning self-rule. Animals, too, must be freed from the brutality of an outside force. Now, I speak to audiences all around the world. Sometimes there are small groups, and sometimes it's up to 5,000 people. And they're all good, caring, decent, loving people, and they all genuinely want to change the world as long as they don't have to change themselves. <laughs> but life does not work that way. First we change in our hearts, and then the world follows. <laughs> we need visionary leaders to draw us all together. I don't simply want to create new vegans although that really is an important part of what I try to do. I want to empower new champions and leaders in the vegan movement, and that is why I will be spending a lot of time and resources promoting everything that is being done here in Israel. philosopher and U-boat captain, spent eight years in prison for condemning German intellectuals for being cowards. And he wrote, when the Nazis came for the communists, I remained silent. I was not a communist. When they locked up the Democrats, I remained silent. I was not a Democrat. When they came for the trade unionists, I did not speak out. I was not a trade unionist. When they came for the Jews, I remained silent. I was not a Jew. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak out. Men and women of integrity like you must speak out and act courageously. Is it not better to light a candle than to curse the darkness? All the darkness in the world cannot put out the light of a single candle. I believe another day is dawning, and if I close my eyes, I can feel her heartbeat.
So do not be afraid of the meat and dairy industry. We've already won the intellectual battles. We have all the facts on our side. Victory is on the way. She's on the march. Please remember Gandhi's words. First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. The last sentence of Scott Fitzgerald's book, The Great Gatsby, reads, So we beat on, boats against the tide, drawn back ceaselessly into the past. I ask the general community, are we to live forever in a sick, smug and cruel past? Let's not relive history, let's make history, because that is what leaders do. <laughs> Judge White's closing words on the bonfires of the vanities were these. The law is humanity's feeble attempt at decency. So I ask you all to join the, the battle in the war that decency cannot afford to lose. Because in the end, only three things matter. How deeply you loved, how gently you lived, and how gracefully you let go of things that were not meant for you. Meat was not meant for you. Our animal cousins have survived millions of years of evolution. They've earned the right to share this planet with us in peace. And they have waited long enough. The brutes and the bullies have been Goliath. But David is coming. room. Maybe he is one of you. And if not you, who? And if not now, when? soon because tomorrow I'm going to ch challenge Patrick to an arm wrestling. <laughs> uh, I'm really quite pissed off because Patrick has been photoshopping <laughs> his face on my body. <laughs> Before I go, um, when I was a little boy, my mother used to read to me every night from a book called Winnie the Pooh. Has anyone heard of it? <laughs> Um, one bit is this, and she used to read it to me to let me know what she felt about me. Christopher Robin is reading to Winnie the Pooh, the teddy bear, and he reads, If ever there is a tomorrow when we are not together, there is something you must always remember. You are braver than you believe, stronger than you seem, Smarter than you think, but 
most importantly, even when we're apart, I'll always be with you. large numbers of activists to act in efficient methods and what are those methods? <laughs> Not in well, easy. well let me tell you if it was easy it would be done already. The animal rights activist movement if you like is the most balkanized of all movements you could imagine. They are in, I always say that as I say we've got 500 projects and we deal with our mailing list is 90,000 people, 3 million hits on our website. And we don't sell anything. All we do is basically give, give money away. <laughs> quite a kind of work. Um, we need to, to accept the fact that this is a broad church. Everyone is welcome. At one end, you may have people like the RSPCA, the welfareists or as I would call them, the Royal Society for, Society for Pretending to Care for Animals. <laughs> and at the other end, you have the ALF. Yeah. Wow. There is room for everybody. I wish there were more, more funds going in this direction rather than that, that direction. And if you look at the numbers of people like the RSPC, you find that they money they're getting is actually dropping. The only reason why they're doing so well is that people are dying and leaving the question. Mm -hmm. So there, there is change. Um, how do we get everyone to, uh, to work together? Unfortunately, we're dealing with human beings where egos are so important. Anybody, any fool can get up on stage, nicely rehearse speech and uh, inspire an audience. But to, to be really successful, we really need to deal right across the board from activists in the street, little kids in school, right up to the corporate boardrooms of the biggest companies in the world. And so we need a new paradigm, a new way of interacting with the broader community. I didn't say it in here, but um, you know, by 2048, all our fisheries will be dead. The lungs and the arteries of the earth. If any of the algorithms that I pre presented today to you are correct, I'm not saying all of them, even most of them, that means that no child under the age of five will ever reach retirement age. Now, does that not chill your blood? If, if everyone on the street out there realize how dire the situation is, every government in this world would fall. By 2048, all our fisheries will be dead. And during quick q and A, I'm going to ask myself a question because there's an Israeli crew member on one of our ships, and she said, Philip, I want you to tell the people in Israel something about the oceans, because that's an area that is completely neglected in Israel. So I don't know. If you want me, I will answer her question. Please do. What about the situation here? Um, it's, it's a, you know, I'm sure that all of you at some stage has uh, had a high school teacher, a biology teacher, who would say to you, I'll show you a picture of a rat's brain, and then compare it with a picture of a dog's brain, and a human brain, and a chip brain. And he would say that the brains become larger, and the convolutions on the neocortex become more pronounced, and he would offer this up as proof of the superior intelligence of humans over animals. But he very conveniently forgets that the human brain is 1,300 cc's. The orca's brain is 6,000. And the sperm whale's brain is 9,000. And all mammals, from mice to men, have three lobes in their brain. Except the cetaceans, dolphins and whales. They have four lobes. And the fourth law is involved in thinking and communicating the very qualities 
that we admire in great minds. Now, people go around the world and see all our projects that we've const constructed in some parts of the world. We have, um, we're facing with big corporations and governments, big companies that employ a million people are working with us and they've converted all their factory canteens from serving meat to only vegetarian. Now that is a very big, powerful multiplier effect. Our Kindness Kids program, for example, where we have kids ambassadors who we give them a lot of support and money, and school uniforms and education, but they go to their communities and their families and they tell their families they want the household to be vegetarian. Veganism in this part of the world is impossible for the moment. And we've had great success. We started it off only with, with, with one school, and I think we have over 1,000 schools in eight cities. They can touch the buildings and talk to the people who work there. But no one knows what we do for drift netting, long lining, whaling, shark finning, plastic and sewage dumping, um, dead zones, and agricultural runoff. Because they're all invisible. Like all atrocities, out of sight is out of mind. So we need to understand that the fishing industry is a squalid, taxpayer-funded scam. And the dynamics are quite asymmetric. Bigger ships, bigger capacities, larger freezers, spotter planes, sonar technology, toxic chemicals, richer consumers, bigger appetites, and dirtier governments. Versus fewer fish, powerless creatures, poisoned oceans, sicker animals, unimaginable suffering, bigger appetites that you can possibly imagine, fractured food chains, extinct species, and cruel wastage. I urge everybody to please read the book, The Empty Oceans. Now, everyone is concerned nowadays only about the whales, because whales are iconic animals, loved by everybody. So I think we should still continue to fight for them, because if we can't save the whales, we can't save anyone, period. Not the dolphin, not the tuna, not the albatross, not the sharks, not the turtles, not the seals, and therefore, not the tigers, lions, elephants, deers, or kangaroos. We can't save anybody. We can't even save you. You see, this is not a zero-sum game where the poacher's loss is the environmentalist's gain. It is worse. If the poachers win, we just don't lose. Everybody dies. And that is the message we're trying to get across. The Dutch government has just given Sea Shepherd of many, many millions of euros. And I don't know if it's been announced publicly, but, I, but there's no one here from the press anyway. But the new ship that we, we, we're using that money to build is going to be so fast, it'll out, there's nothing the Japanese can get away from. We'll get them. So, um, I had to answer that question on behalf of my Israeli friend who now lives in Melbourne. There's another question by Eyal. Uh, how do you choose in which projects to invest? And how do you measure efficiency of projects, cost benefit, right. and so on? When I first started 25 years ago, I made a lot of mistakes. Um, I wasn't very focused. But now we have a huge network. Uh, Professor Drucker from Harvard University uh, said uh, they were my low-cost probes. I've got people around the world who feed me information. And we're not a bottomless pit anyway. We're not a foundation. You know, we're just two people. So um, we're, we're very focused. And how do we measure it? Two very important characters. How many lives are you going to save? And how active are you promoting the vegan course? If you tick those two boxes, you have a conversation with us. And, and sometimes, most, most times, they don't want money. They want encouragement. They want a feeling that they're validated. They want someone who fly 32 hours to their country and spend a week with them. So the bear project, for example? The bear project. Yeah. Uh, yes, um, it's we not have... It's pure veganism. It's it's, that's correct. Uh, um, that is an exception, I suppose, to one of many exceptions to the rule. We've invested quite heavily in the, the bear project in, Af in, sorry, in, in China with the moon bears in the bile industry, and the dancing bear campaign in India, for example. Um, 
this is, this is, I'll only take, may I take one minute to explain it? Yes. It's um, a wonderful project. We have a great group in India, Wildlife SOS, that we've been funding for many years, has been fighting a campaign to take the dancing bears off the streets of India. The dancing bears come about like this. Uh, the gypsies go out and kill the mother in the, in the forest and take the cub. And they stick a hot poker through her nose with a rope and a piece of glass. So she's in constant pain and agony and it festers full of pus. And they make her dance and she grows up to be a big bear. Now tourists have been, this has been going on since Mughal times, several centuries. So what we've been doing is putting money into, into a project for the calendar gypsies who run this, this program between Delhi and Agra, basically. And we hand over money to them, and they surrender the bear to us. But they don't get the money. We take that money and buy them a business. It'll be a fruit and vegetable shop, or sewing machines, or a rickshaw, something like that. <laughs> so now, um, the calendar gypsies don't have to be itinerant. They can stay in one place. Now the kids can go to school. They're getting an education. And um, as a consequence of this, they are now helping us handle the bears. They've become very accomplished bear handlers. And they are so disgusted with what they were doing in the past. Now, these calendar gypsies, they're Muslims. By, well, they are Muslims. And um, a lot of their kids, the girls in particular, marry very young. Uh, so we're now trying to think about ways uh, to encourage them not to do so, like um, put up money. This is our plan to invest quite significant money to say, we will pay for your wedding, and weddings are expensive, and families go into debt for, for generations from the local money lender. We'll put up the money for the, the girl to, um, when she gets married, as long as she, does, she waits till she's either 18 or graduates from high school. So quite often a girl with 18 doesn't want to get married. Not, not yet. They may want to get married when they're in their 20s. They want to have a bit of a career. So we're hoping this, this will work. Now I don't know how the community is going to react to it because we're dealing with centuries of tradition, you see. So we have to be very cautious. But the good news with the Wildlife SOS is that in August last year, the last dancing bear was taken off the streets in India. Well, this is the year of the monkey, so we have a new challenge. Uh, any questions? Makal? Okay. That's a very good question. One thing we should not do is bludgeon them, abuse them, for the following reason. When we have all the facts on the environment, on the cruelty, on human health, on the rivers, the oceans, the dead zones, we are in an unassailable position. We know too much. We have the truth on our side. But when we bludgeon them, with our better knowledge, we are bullying. You should never bully someone who doesn't share your point of view. So what I suggest is something along these lines. I think it was the poet Shelley 
but I know what you Israelis are like, you all like doing research. I think of Rochelle, he said, he convinced against his will is of his own opinion still. So don't, don't bludgeon the guy. Um, but interact in an intelligent way, just a little bit. Present yourself in a very friendly, open way so that he or she respects you. Uh, in business, you know, people do business with people they like. And if the guy that you're dealing with actually likes you because of your manners, your style, the way you dress, you're clean, you're polite, and you're engaging, he's going to listen. Because generally speaking, people are, generally speaking, are, <laughs> are quite rational, are often rational, occasionally rational. <laughs> But, but I think uh, part of the problem is us. Um, I know, I have a fairly, um, I, I move in certain circles in other countries, and um, people know that I'm a vegan advocate, campaigner for the vegan movement. And they go out and Google vegan activism. And they see me there making speeches. And whenever I make a speech, I, to, to any organ, I always wear a suit. I always try to be polite and not get into a fight. But then on the same page, there'll be another vegan advocate swearing profanities. And they think we're all in the same camp. And that turns them off. So I think it's a, we should be very cautious um, as, as campaigners. This is not about us. It's about the bears in that cage who's going insane. And he, he doesn't say, I want you to win the argument. He says, just get me out of here. I don't know if that answered your question, sir. I, I, did, did I just see a very polite Israeli? <laughs> אני אגיד בעברית, כי האנגלית שלי לא סבבה. נתניה בכל זאת. בתור מעצמה טבעונית עולמית. הוא לא חושב אולי שווה להשקיע בישראל, להוביל אותנו מחמישה אחוז לעשרים אחוז. Yeah. I'll translate while you're looking at the papers. He asked here, as a, a vegan empire, don't you think that we should grow from 5% of vegans to 20% and that we are worth um, being invested? Yeah. And then they answered that you've already said that. Well, if, if veganism was a company, I'd be buying shares in it. <laughs> I, I agree with you, yeah. Um, Glamour wrote a book called The Tipping Point. At what point do we become mainstream? We probably never become mainstream, but we'll become so powerfully influential that meat eaters will be considered in the same light as smokers. <laughs> it's like having a very uh, ugly mistress. Uh, you're, you're too uh, embarrassed. You, you might, might crave her body, but you'd be too embarrassed to be seen in public with her. I, I think that's... Uh, uh, a good point. We've, we've got to, a 5% number is, is, is nice, but it's not big enough. But as I say, you know, by 2040, we're running out of time. That, that, that's, that is the bottom line. Yes, um, I get depressed <laughs> I, because of the things I see on a daily basis. Um, it, it, it hurts me. I still wake up in the middle of the night screaming with nightmares. 
it's a, that is true. Um, but we, we're here by choice, you see. The animals are not. We could walk away tomorrow and go back to a very happy, peaceful, simple, uninspired, unexplained life. But we're not going to do that. Not a chance. Um, I remember reading about uh, Hegel. He wrote about the owls of, Ni of Minerva. Owls are supposed to be very intelligent, brilliant, clever, wise animals. And he said that uh, the owls of Minerva, you only hear the beating of their wings at twilight. And what he meant was, we only understand the events of the day after they've taken place, at night. So, the people that we're fighting with, they will get it, but, it, and it'll, but it'll be later. We can only hope that it is not too late. What I think we should also remember is that sometimes we will have victories, and quite often activists, when they have a victory, they rest on their laurels. We've seen it so many times with jumps racing, live animal exports briefly in Australia were banned, and we relaxed. And that was a fatal mistake. Um, Bertolt Brecht wrote a book called uh, The Resistible Rise of Arturo Yui. And it was written in about 1941, when Hitler was still around and alive. But Brecht was so smart, he was imagining the time when the dictator was dead. And at the end of the play, the guy comes out of the front and he says, do not rejoice in his defeat, ye men, for though the world stood up and defeated the bastard, the bitch that bore him is on heat again. So we might win the battle today, but they are out there waiting to pounce back. They won't go away with one punch. It will be a relentless campaign for a long time. Um, Albert Camus wrote um, a lovely book, uh, called La Peste, The Plague, you probably read it, about the Algerian town of Oran. Now the town was invaded by a plague of, uh, of rats. And the township didn't get along with each other for a long time. But on this one cause, they all came together and they rallied and fought off the plague of rats. And they finally succeeded and everything was fine. But sometimes, when the evening breeze comes in from the east, you still get the rotting stench reminding all the citizens that the rats are still down there underground, lurking, waiting, and most importantly, that is, there is now a new world order that was never going to go away. And here is a me message in a political sense as well. Vigilance eternal vigilance is the price we pay for liberty. We be vigilant all the time, constant, always on the march, because the bad guys are doing the same. Um, I, I just wonder, I thought I might I wrote, scribble down some names about people we've known the last 25 years and ask you, what do you know that they have all have in common? People like Adel Ramos, Chick Mendes, David Chain, Di Fossi, Alicia Soto, Dorothy Stang, Fernando Pereira, Jane Tipson, Jenny May, Jill Phipps, Mike Hill, Tom Warbley, just to name a few. What have they all got in common? I think one guy knows. They killed both the... They didn't die. Killed. They were murdered. The bad guys, and we're talking about meat and dairy industry, the hunting industry, the timber industry, the mining industry, the poaching industry. So um, we're dealing with people who are criminals. Yeah, one last question. No? See, <laughs> <laughs> do you want to choose? I'm feeling fine. I thought this was water, but it turns out it's vodka. <laughs> okay, so three more questions, because we have very good 
מאיה? כן, כן, אחר כך אני אתן לכם. אמרנו שלוש שאלות אחרונות. Am I afraid of these crooks? Yes, I am. But I'm. But some of them. I'm sorry. Yes, I am. Uh, I am scared of these guys. But Patrick's could look after me. <laughs> but the person who is most worried, because we we live in a pretty, uh, we're pretty visible, if you can understand what I mean. Um, but my mum worries about me a lot. I have to say. Now, what what turned turn me away from my previous life? Uh, in the course of my professional life, I went out as a merchant banker, as an advisor, to a company that was a multinational, it was huge, and it had businesses in every industry you could imagine. And I went around to see all of them as I flew around the country. And one of the businesses that they had was, turned out to be a slaughterhouse. And I have to tell you, what I saw that day absolutely terrified me. I was completely, utterly disillusioned. My whole sense of being was shattered. I won't tell you what I did in regard to my employment. I was the vice president of Citibank and I ran the mergers acquisitions business for that part of the world. But I decided to become a vegetarian. I didn't know anything about dairy. I thought that dairy was beautiful hills and meadows and streams with, with Shelley and Wordsworth and um, beautiful poetry and and it was a lovely, peaceful place. But I happened to be on a business trip to India, and uh, I saw a dairyman dragging his car, his, his, his cow that had been injured in a lorry accident and broken her spine. And he was dragging her on a chain to the slaughterhouse gates. And she couldn't move. So he was throwing chili powder in her eyes and shoving sharp objects up her anus. And beside her was a scrawny, starving, thin calf. And he got to the slaughterhouse gates and handed the cow over to the butcher. But before he let go of the chain, the bastard milked her. Now, if that doesn't change the heart of a man, nothing will. So when I went back to Australia, I said, I'm going to study this industry. And I found out what we were doing in the West was every bit as egregious as that poor dairyman. I thought he was a criminal. No, he wasn't. The criminals have boardrooms. They, they fly first class. Are you sure we shouldn't be bullies sometimes? Yeah, I think. I, I think you do whatever is effective. If bullying helps you win a battle, which ends in, in winning a war, that's fine. But if it doesn't help you win the war, there are better ways. And, and it depends on what you call bullying. I don't think profanity helps. Um, but you can be, as I said, the word satyagraha, the, the truth force. Tell the truth, fearlessly and forcefully. But, but don't intimidate. Uh, because you want to enlist the other side, like we did with the Kalanda Gypsies. They're all on our side nowadays. And we've got so many examples of the big businesses that we talked about with a million employees. They didn't want to do that to start off with. But in the end, they're our biggest advocates. Um, and it's a great temptation. Sometimes I'd like to take some guy down the back alley and give him 10 rounds with Muhammad Ali. But, <laughs> I think there are better ways. Ken, if I am able. Human, human rights uh, liberation. What role of technology do you see in uh, animal rights and animal liberation? <coughs> and what technology specifically do you think we should look out for? What is the role of technology in the vegan movement, in the liberation of animals? Yes, that's, actually that's a very good question. Um, Social media is the thing that's going to change this. Um, social media will, bring, properly handled, will bring us very much to the fore. 
if we can actually get into um, the younger generation, particularly in the high schools and universities, uh, that would be a, a, a wonderful role. Uh, I, I don't use these things like Twitter, etc., but I know it's, it's going gangbusters in places like India. Uh, India animal rights movement is just exploding. So the three countries that um, really came into being after the end of World War II, after 1945, are making such great strides as economies and in the idea of rights. Which countries are those? Singapore, India, Israel. Fifty years ago, Singapore was a terrible place, um, full of crime, dirty streets, uh, pickpockets in the streets, rubbish everywhere. Go to Singapore today. The airport is swankier than Trump Tower. There's no rubbish in the street. Singapore's become the Zurich of the East. Um, I, th I think countries like that are the ones that are going to be encouraged. India is the same. Uh, the animal rights movement there is, as I said, we, we built 55 projects in India, and they are doing extremely well. And of course, uh, I don't have to tell you what you're doing here. So it's, it's, it's a credit to all of you. Um, but the problem is not so much activism, it's the general community. I just remembered that, uh, something I just might mention in passing. In World War II, um, Hitler, um, sent an official, one of his the Nazi officials, uh, to Paris to enlist Pablo Picasso in the Nazi cause. And um, in Picasso's apartment, um, the, the official saw this big painting of Guernica depicting the hideous uh, bombing of the Basque village by the Nazis. And the official, trying to flatter the artist, was amazed and he said, this is wonderful. Did you do it? And Picasso said, no, you did. <laughs> the same is true about the animal industrial complex. They didn't build it, we did. The customer did, the customer paid for it. And I tell you, if we can convince the customer that meat is no longer on the menu, they would do a U-turn so quickly their heads would spin because businesses respond very swiftly to changes in the market. And if we can do that, I could say in 10 years time, vegan, <laughs> vegans will not be a nasty word, it'll be a, a badge of honor. Yeah. 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 Uh, contact details about the project. About the project. No. About which project? Contact details. Send me an email. Send me an email. Send me an email. Send me an email. Phil at kindnesstrust.com. Okay, so uh, in the last summer, there, there is a problem in California. They have a drought. They don't have water there. So the governor said that instead of eating meat, the population should eat uh, replacement. Yep. So my question is, do you think that uh, natural disasters and uh, shortage in, in water, I mean, if, if there will be many disasters and people killed, will, will it, check, will it uh, change the politicians? Will they understand? How important it is? It won't hurt. <laughs> um, it would be a tragedy. But we, you know, we've seen what, what's happened with, with the melting glaciers in the Himalayas and the damage that is doing. And now we're fi finding that people are now realizing that they've got to start uh, changing their ways, not to chop down the trees anymore in the north of India, for example. Um, but isn't it a pity that we have got to have a natural disaster like this? We invest in scarce natural resources that we have in natural resources every year, in the Bay of Bengal, for example, um, for no reason. 
You know, and now we're talking about the Mars program is going to cost ten trillion dollars. We've got better maps of Mars than we have of the ocean bed. I mean, this is preposterous nonsense. Well, we are, we really are a stupid species, you know. <laughs> well, I think that's what Occam's razor was all about, you know. When presented with a number of complex competing solutions, the simplest one is the best. Don't eat animals. Amen. There you go. Thank you.